Hello everyone. In this lecture, we are going to talk about how does an antenna work. In this slide, you can see a few antennas which I've designed in the last few years, and I'll be talking about them very briefly towards the end of this uh, lecture. So before we dive into the working mechanism of an antenna, it's perhaps important to understand about their applications. An antenna is an integral part of any wireless communication device ranging from a cell phone to Wi-Fi router, to a car radio, and the list perhaps goes on. Uh, a, a cell phone, which each of us uses every day, has actually several antennas to cover different operations like uh, cellular capability, Wi-Fi, GPS, uh, wireless charging, FM radio, and other applications. Uh, so in summary, uh, any wireless device which we are using has one or more than one antenna integrated into that to make it work. So let's dive into, well, how an antenna really is for how it works. So let's consider a case where we have two charges, a positive charge and a negative charge, and they're located in a close proximity to each other. Now there's some electric field which exists between those two charges and the electric lines of force start from the positive charge and end at the negative charge. Now, if we change the location of those two charges of positive charge go from this location to that location and negative charge go from this to that, the electric lines of force their direction get flipped also, like you can see between those two pictures over here. So, so in the presence of two electric charges, electric field exists. However, there's no radiation which is happening. And the reason for that is those electric charges are not moving yet. Uh, Wikipedia has a nice animation of a dipole antenna, and you will talk about what a dipole antenna is. But what they're trying to demonstrate there is electric charges changing their location across time. As you can see this animation, positive charge come here, then it goes here, then it comes back over here, you know. So when those charges start moving across time, uh, what happens is electromagnetic waves get generated and they start radiating into the free space. And we will study about this phenomenon in the next few slides here. So um, in order to understand it, what's happening, uh, let's consider a case where we have two conductors one over here and the second one over here. And we connect a AC source to those two conductors. And just to remember one thing that for an antenna to work, you always have to connect an AC source because if you connect DC source to that, there is nothing which is changing over time. So no radiation takes place. So in the, in, in the presence of an AC source, an elect electric field gets generated between those two conductors. Well, the electric field has electric lines of force, which are tangential to the electric field. In this uh, picture, you can see the electric lines of force going from the positive to the negative charge here, and then they flip their direction at this location. Now, as far as this positive and negative re charges representation in this picture, that really depends upon your cycle of the AC signal, which you applied over here. So when you end up first half of the cycle, you have positive charges here, negative, and then they flip. In the, in the second half, you know. Now, these electric lines of force, which are being applied here, they apply a force on the conductor. Now, a conductor generally has free electrons, and those electrons start flowing across that conductor, you know. And this displacement of those electrons in that conductor generates an electric current. Now, we have a magnetic field due to that current. Now remember that electric field in this case is varying across time and the reason for that is the applied signal is varying. So perhaps we have a varying electric field and a varying magnetic field and that generates electromagnetic wave, uh, which uh, at some point enters from a transmission line to an antenna. In this picture, let's assume this is our transmission line and this is an antenna structure after that. So after entering the antenna, well, the electric lines of force still exist there, and at some point they radiate into the free space. So till the time those electric lines of force exist between uh, those conductors, till over here, they're bounded because there's a boundary introduced by those two conductors in our example. However, as soon as they enter the free space, there's no boundary which exists, like you can see over here. Uh, so we can connect these electric lines of force, which are generated by the opposite charges because they're moving in the same direction. And that's uh, one way of representing an EM wave propagating in the free space. Well, uh, one other important concept here is about our frequency. So frequency is just the inverse of time. 
so if your time period of this applied signal is only one hertz, it, oh, sorry, one second, that means your frequency is one hertz. If um, so, the one question which we have not answered so far is well, what caused these uh, like this EM waves to leave the antenna and enter the free space? And in order to understand it, let's consider an example of a dipole antenna. Uh, a dipole antenna is a pretty common antenna, which is generally the first antenna which you study on any antenna and propagation course. Uh, so the dipole antenna has two wires. Each uh, wire has a length of a quarter of a wavelength. And a wavelength is basically speed of light divided by the frequency. And the reason speed of light here is because the waves, electromagnetic waves, travel at the speed of the light. So if you divide that by your frequency, you get the wavelength. Generally, it represents wavelength in meters because speed of light is in meters per second. So in this example, let's consider that you have some electric lines of force which exist between those two conductors right over here. And you have a dipole antenna and time zero. Well, nothing, I mean, all the waves only, all this waves only exist till here, you know. And on the top, you can see the Z axis, which is a representation of the spatial axis in this case. And it's represented based on the wavelength. This is half wavelength, this is a full wavelength over here. Now, at time t by 2, which correspond to half of the cycle, you can see that some of these electric lines of force have traveled through approximately half wavelength distance in the free space. Now, <clears throat> in the next half cycle of the sine wave in this example, well, opposite uh, electric lines of force are being generated because of the opposite charges over here. And effectively, at this instant over here, the net charge on this antenna is zero because some positive charges got created because of these waves, let's say at this point, and then some negative charges get created because of these waves at this point, so the net charge becomes zero. So these electric lines of force or EM waves, they really have to leave the antenna at this point, you know, and start propagating in the free space because the net charge in the antenna at this point is zero. And that is something which causes those uh, waves to leave the antenna and re start radiating in the free space. Now, one thing to one thing which is really important over here for that to happen, the antenna has to have some certain characteristics. For example, for a dipole antenna, it needs to have a certain length of this wire on this side and this side. You know. Okay, well, going forward, one important concept is a concept of wavelength, which we already introduced, but it really relates to the size of the antenna in many cases. So let's assume that if you have a frequency of 100 megahertz, uh, uh, like an FM radio frequency, your time period in this case for this wave, which you are generally applying to the antenna is about 10 microseconds, and your wavelength is about three meters. Well, however, if you change the frequency from 100 megahertz to 2.4 gigahertz, which is a common Wi-Fi frequency band, uh, your time period reduces quite a bit. It means the applied signal has to have a much narrower period, but your wavelength, it reduces quite a bit also. And what it means is that the antenna dimension, which is in this case a quarter of a wavelength, reduces quite a bit as you go from 100 megahertz to 2.4 gigahertz because the wavelength has reduced quite a bit. And going on, if you go to 76 gigahertz, which is an automotive band, well, that number reduces quite a bit more. So I think the important thing over here is, well, depending on the frequency at which you're operating, your antenna size or its dimension are generally related to that frequency. Uh, so I think so far uh, we have covered about how an antenna radiates. So let's look at a few simple examples. A monopole antenna is a pretty common antenna which we use for more research applications because it's very, very simple to make in the lab. So all it has is a wire and there's some coaxial cable below that wire. And the, the wire height is a quarter of a wavelength uh, for a monopole antenna. And here's a good example of that. There's a SMA connector over here. And you put a wire inside of that connector, solder it towards the base of that. We adjust the height of the wire so that it's the right frequency. In this case, it's about three centimeters approximately. Uh, but the one problem with the monopole antennas is they need some sort of a ground plane below them for their efficient operation. So here's another example of an antenna which uh, is basically working at 24 gigahertz and it's like 10 times smaller in terms of height versus this one over here. So over here, what we did was we used some coaxial cables and uh, connected the outer conductor of the coaxial cables at the bottom of this board. And the inner conductor is 
you can see it over here and has four of them you know in this example um so here this is a this was a example of a monopole antenna well here's another antenna setup where we have a bunch of them in a certain array format for a certain research experiment another antenna which is pretty common is sleeve dipole antenna perhaps most of you have seen that uh, at some point in your life i'm sure uh, so what it uh, so i think compared to a monopole antenna what it, what it has is a sleeve which is a metallic sleeve uh, so th this is your wire, which is similar to your uh, monopole antenna, but the sleeve, its length is about a uh, quarter of wavelength also. And uh, they're generally used for ham radios and for RC applic applications. Uh, uh, another antenna, which is, uh, was a lot more common in 80s and 90s and pro probably early 2000s was a Yogi Huda antenna. And it was generally used for... Uh, capturing the signal for your TV. And what it has is basically a dipole antenna right here. And it has a bunch of ref um, reflectors and directors over here. And the reason that it has more than one dipole antenna and a few reflectors and uh, directors is just to enhance the antenna gain. And that's a separate topic and we will study about that in one of the future videos. Uh, uh, one other antenna which is fairly common is a patch antenna. Uh, it's generally used for a lot in, in a lot of different applications where you have some planar board and the antenna is part of that PCB. So what a patch antenna is, uh, it's basically uh, there are two uh, copper layers on the top and the bottom and a substrate in the bit in between, which is a dielectric also. And generally we etch the copper from the top layer, you know, and make a patch antenna out of it. Uh, and there's a small transmission line which is going to the patch antenna in this case, and it's being fed from the back side. I will not go into some of these curves on this plot, but basically what they're trying to show is the frequency operation for that antenna which we designed. Uh, generally, the patch antenna or the dipole antenna, they are resonant antennas, so their um, operational bandwidth is a bit small. Um, so generally, they're being used for applications where you exactly know your frequency and you're gonna operate at that specific frequency. And they're good for those applications. The patch antenna, uh, perhaps a variant of that is being used in cell phones also. It's a pretty common antenna, I would say. Well, the last one I would like to touch base on dish antenna. Well, hopefully all of you have seen that. Uh, so if you have an isotropic antenna, that antenna is radiating everywhere, you know, in the free space. It means in radiating in a sphere. However, if you really want to get more gain of the antenna, which then you have to make that antenna more directional, it means instead of radiating everywhere in the free space, it's perhaps looking in a certain direction. And that's exactly what a dish antenna does. So what it has is it has electromagnetic waves which hit the antenna. And in this case, I'm assuming it's a receive antenna. They hit it and they get reflected back from this uh, uh, parabolic reflector and they come towards this feed structure, which is generally a horn antenna. And from there, they go to a receiver. And now the beauty of that antenna is the physical size of that dish is pretty big as compared to the frequency. And that introduces a lot of gain and make this antenna pattern really directional. Um, here's a example of that dish antenna. Like I said, there's a dish. The one which I was representing here is shown over here. And here's uh, one of your uh, receive antennas, which is like I said, it could be a horn antenna or some other very type of antenna. Uh, over here okay well so i think in this lecture we went through over uh, we went over how a basic antenna works i talked a little bit about a few antenna types if you're really interested in learning more about antennas then there are a few other topics which i think you should study like polarization it's gain versus directivity antenna beam width uh, antenna bandwidth but what that tells you is uh, what is the frequency range where you're going to pray that antenna input impedance which is really important because you have to connect that antenna to some uh, source also and you have to make sure that there's uh, matching is ensured in that case and uh, first transmission equation is another important thing so antennas are just radiators right or receivers ultimately for us to ensure that we receive the signal we have to uh, do the math to make sure that the antenna we are choosing it has enough gain uh, so that we can receive a signal and use it, you know. So, and, and then we covered that kind of stuff in this uh, transmission equation, understand the uh, overall path loss concept, you know. And lastly, I think uh, uh, 
uh, it will be nice if you dig di a bit more deeper into different antenna types. So I'll be making some videos about each of that topic and posting it to this channel so that you can look into them if you're interested. Um, feel free to subscribe to this channel and like it so that you can get a notification whenever I post a new video. Well, thank you very much for listening to me and I wish you a great day ahead of you. Thank you.